There is a lot of debate about Jesus' self-identity, who Jesus thought Jesus was. And um, some people attack the Christian faith, or should I say challenge Christian doctrine, um, by saying that Jesus never even wanted you to believe the things you believe about him. Now this is, this is definitely not true, but one of the ways you can establish who Jesus thought he was is the titles Jesus used for himself. In particular, the title Son of Man. It's the most common title Jesus used for himself, and it tells us a lot about who Jesus was. Uh, some of us probably don't realize this. We just tend to think Son of Man refers to the humanity of Christ, but it actually refers to a lot more. And it fits here in our Jesus in the Old Testament series. The reason why I'm doing this is because when Jesus uses the term Son of Man, that has a heavy, value-laden you know, meaning from the Old Testament. So Jesus is using a title that he didn't invent, that came from the Old Testament, or I should say he invented it, but just before his incarnation. And this comes with a lot of weight behind it. And we're going to look into that today. Um, it's a key to knowing who Jesus was. In Matthew 16, verse 13, <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll say this, by the way, just, I know I announced, if, if for some of you guys, I announced that I was going to be doing the Feasts of Israel in the book of Leviticus. We're going to look at the seven Feasts of Israel and how they typify Christ. But I'm pausing on that. Probably next week we'll do that. The week was just too crazy. So I wasn't able to prepare it in time, and I don't want to teach it when it's not ready. Um, so um, despite appearances, <laughs> I'm going to wait until it's fully prepared. So here we are, Matthew 16, 13. Who is Jesus? Well, in, in this passage, it says that they came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus, he asks his disciples, quote, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And I think there's like a, like almost a tongue-in-cheek hint here at who Jesus is because he's like, who do they say that the Son of Man is? This is Jesus' title for himself. It's very clear he uses this title more than any other title. He calls himself Son of Man more than he calls himself anything else and uh, many more times actually. And we tend to think that it just refers to his humanity. Like when Jesus says, this, I'm the Son of Man, we're just thinking, oh, if you're, if you're the Son of a man, then you are. You're, you're a man, as in mankind. It, it, man here means not male, but, but human. That's what it means. Son of human. That's, that's what he's saying. Um, and that's true. It does speak to his humanity. But the Old Testament shows us there's a rich background for Jesus' life and teachings. And there is for this phrase, son of man, as well. So we're going to look at some Old Testament connections to this title of Jesus. And I think it will, it will bless you on how, how, how bold and full the claim of who Jesus is, is embedded in the phrase, son of man. So first off, the first thing you get in the Old Testament, if you just do like a survey of all the passages where the phrase son of man comes up, the first thing you get is how humble and lowly it is. So Psalm 8, we're going to look at that. Psalm 8 verse 4, <clears throat> we, you, you guys know this. It's actually in some of our worship songs. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Now this term son of man in this verse, it's saying like, who are we? that God even cares about us. We're so lowly. We're so weak. We're so small. We're here today, gone tomorrow, like a grass of the field, woof, burnt up and gone. That's the idea. So we are, we are lowly. So son of man has a humble, lowly feel to it. It's, it's the idea is that here's Adam. Yeah, he was created to rule. Ah, but he was cursed. Ah, from dust you came and to dust you shall return. Yes, and you will have struggles in life, and you will have this burden placed upon you, and your kids, the sons of man, the sons of Adam, right, they're going to be suffering the same kinds of things. So it's this lowly, burdened kind of feel. In Numbers 23, 19, we have it again, and this is a passage you might think, don't bring that up, Mike, but actually I think it's really interesting um, and in how it relates to Christ. <clears throat> it says, God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind, has he said and will he not do it? Or he, uh, yeah, has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Now, at the time Numbers is written, Jesus is not incarnate. So I'm not bothered by the thing where it says God is not a son of man. Well, he wasn't. The incarnation was an event in history that had not taken place yet. God is not, part of his eternal nature was, you know, from time eternity, was not that he's like man. No, he had to take on human form. That's what makes this so crazy is because it's so, we're so lowly. We're so far down here. That's the idea. The, and that's the emphasis here. Um, however, when Christ came and took on human form, he was unlike all of the other humans because he walked in perfect sinlessness. So we don't <clears throat> think he's like 
behaviorally like a human, but he became positionally like a human, the son of man. In Job 25 verse 6, we have another statement that I think is really, really neat for this series, Jesus in the Old Testament. <coughs> Excuse me. Pardon me, I'm, a, I'm, I'm merely a, a, a son of man myself <laughs> in the lowly sense, that's for sure. Uh, Job 25 6, it says, How much less a man who is a maggot and the son of man who is a worm? Now, I'm not going to go into the whole con- context of Job and Job 25 and everything, but what's interesting is here we have another one of these rare moments where the phrase son of man comes up in the Old Testament, and it says the son of man is a worm. Now, you might be like me wondering, what do you mean worm? What's the Hebrew for worm there? Because there's a certain kind of worm that seems to represent Christ being this toloth worm that climbs up a tree and attaches itself to the tree and it dies and and its, its, its offspring have to consume it, and it creates red dye out of it, and they make shellac out of it, and then it sits on the tree and turns into white flaky stuff, like from scarlet to like white as snow. Like this, there's this neat thing about this toloth worm, and that's the word that's used here in Job 25, 6. It's the son of man who is a worm, who is a worm. Um, <clears throat> this is not, I don't think, a reference directly to Christ. It's a reference to humankind. We're lowly like worms. So son of man has this really strong like vibe to it. Like it's like you're just you're just a pathetic human. Right? Like in the Star Trek universe, like when the when the Klingons say, human, you you weak little human. Like that. No? Anyway. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. It's like you're just you're just weak little pathetic little humans. That's the that is the idea. That's the idea of Son of Man. Now you can already see that this does apply to Christ. Right? He comes in lowly form. He's he's born in a manger, which is not a not a good thing. You know, and he comes and he and he lives in poverty, right? When his when his uh, when his mother Mary goes to offer the offering after having a boy, she offers the special offering that's given if you're in, if you're in poverty, if you're poor, and you give the two turtle doves because you don't you can't afford the proper offering for this child. So it's to say, he's lowly. When he says the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, he's lowly. But there's a lot more here. That's just one aspect of the whole Son of Man thing, and it gets much better. So Psalm 80 is what we'll look at next. So you're going to want to turn there. We're going to read through Psalm 80. <clears throat> this is going to show the Son of Man as the restorer of Israel. And Psalm 80 is one of those psalms where you're like, you read it and you go, is this a messianic psalm or is it like something else? Because as you read the end of the psalm, it feels very much about Jesus. And as you read the beginning of the psalm, it feels very much about Israel. And you can't quite identify where the shift takes place through the psalm. But I think that's intentional. Because Christ came as the representative, fulfilling what Israel couldn't do and doing for Israel what, what Israel needed, as well as for the whole world. This is what I would say is like a prophetic typology here in Psalm 80. Now, because of our background in the Jesus in the Old Testament series, I think that this will click for you. But if you thought prophecy has to just be simple predictions about future events, simple fulfillments, well, that's one kind of prophecy. And I like that kind of prophecy. It's good evidence for the Bible. But there's also another kind of prophetic thing, and that's typology. And so Psalm 80 is like a typological psalm. It's messianic. And as I've told our youth ministry sometimes, I'll say it's (laughs) messianic-ish. That's kind of how it is, where it's not... This is about Messiah, but it is about Messiah, but it's, it's, it's more embedded in the figures and the foreshadowing than it is this sort of clear statements. So let's, <clears throat> let's, we'll look at it here. It's going to say that Israel is the vine. It's going to sh- show that Israel has come out of Egypt. Do these things sound familiar? Out of Egypt? In the Matthew study in this series, we talked about out of Egypt and how that related to Israel and Christ. So it starts out about Israel, but as it goes on, it more and more becomes about Christ. Psalm 80 verse 1. Um, I'll start at the very beginning here. To the choir master, according to the lilies, a testimony of Asaph, a psalm. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. Remember who is the good shepherd? You who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim. Think of the tabernacle here and what it represents, the heavenly scene that it actually represents. Shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. Stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. So it's the beginning of the psalm. Like a lot of psalms, it has like a, a summary idea in the beginning. The beginning is, help us, Lord. You are you are way up here. You're all these wonderful things. Now help us. We need help. Now it's going to talk about what's going on, why they need help. Verse 4, O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? 
You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us an object of contention for our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. So what they're being saved from is judgment. God's anger. And this is, is is God an angry God? Look, if God's ever angry, which he is sometimes angry, it's because he should be. His anger is proper, unlike most of my anger, which is generally misplaced, which is why I try to not let it affect my actions and attitudes as much as possible. God's anger is proper. It's good. So when it says, God, you're angry at us, it's because they deserve his anger. But they're appealing to him, the one who's mad at them, to save them from his anger that is rightly deserved. This sounds to me like salvation, right? This is, this is exactly what I need. <clears throat> so they say, restore us. They're drinking bitter judgment. They're drinking bitter judgment. This, you, you can kind of see how some of this connects to Jesus, right? He ends up drinking the judgment. He drinks the cup, right? He fully drinks down that cup that, that he spoke of in the garden. Um, then in verse 8, you brought a vine out of Egypt. A vine out of Egypt. That's, a, that's Israel, right? In the passage. But it's also Jesus. He is the vine. I am the vine. And Matthew He came out of Egypt, fulfilling what Hosea said about Israel, how they had this kind of out of Egypt theme that went through. It's not direct one-to-one prophecy. It's foreshadowing typological prophecy. That's what this is. I'll keep reading and it'll make more sense. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it, and all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted for the sun whom you made strong for yourself. Now this could be seen as just about Israel, but then now it starts to shift. They have burned it with fire. They've cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your face, but let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man, the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. So here we see the psalm. Israel's like, God, you're up here, you're holy, you're amazing. We're down here, we're suffering, we're in pain because of our sin. The way out for us is the Son of Man who will be strengthened for us. Now, who's the Son of Man? The discussion, is it Israel or is it some other figure? Well, if it's Israel, it's the only time the Son of Man ever refers to Israel as a nation. Every other time in the entire Bible, it's always talking about one person. Always. I think that's consistent here too. I think we have... Israel, they fall, and then Jesus comes and he says, I'm going to do, I'm going to take your place, Israel. And of course, the place of the world dies for the whole world. So they're the vine that was broken down. Well, he's the choice vine. He's the good vine. He's the true vine. Right? They're, they are, they come out of Egypt. Jesus comes out of Egypt. They're drinking the cup that God has mixed for them, so to speak, of God's wrath. Jesus drinks it in full for them. He's the son of man whom is strengthened for his sake they're saved. For his suffering, they're delivered. That's the Psalm 80. Now, Psalm 8, verse uh, 4 through 6, I think strengthens this even more, strengthens this concept, um, connecting with New Testament teaching. In Psalm 8, verse 4, it says, What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. You may have known this psalm, not because of Psalm 8, but because of Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2 actually quotes this about Jesus. So we have God's understanding and obviously correct interpretation of this psalm. You would have read this and thought, oh, this is about humans in general. But it doesn't make sense because where has he put all things under our feet? We've we've sort of lost all this in the fall. But in Christ, he comes as the ultimate son of man, representing all of us, just like Adam represented all of us. He dies on the cross. He rises again. And now all things are under his feet. And in him, we, we also enjoy the inheritance, the scripture says. So, um, our dominion is in his dominion. Do you see that there's this, there's this exchange of the fall belongs to us is transferred to him that we might rise with him. That's the idea. 
with Israel and with humans in general. But that's just half of it. The son of man thing gets way better when we keep looking and we look at Ezekiel and Daniel. So in the, in the book of Ezekiel, turn to Ezekiel chapter 4. In, a, in the book of Ezekiel, we have the only prophet of Israel who is called the son of man. And he is called the son of man a lot. <laughs> yes, he is. Over and over and over again. He's the only, I, I think the only guy in the Bible directly called the, a son of man or hey, son of man. I don't think he's ever with the definite article called the son of man. God just says son of man this or a son of man. Um, <clears throat> that phrase, but never like the son of man. But the term comes and it just simply means you're just a human. You're a lowly little human. That's the basic idea, but there's more to it than that. Ezekiel, you could do a whole study on the typology of how Ezekiel represents Jesus Christ in foreshadowing. But I'll give you a couple examples. Ezekiel, above and beyond other prophets, is notably humiliated. Brought low. He's forced to like, like do things that make him uncomfortable that he's not, he's not cool with. In Ezekiel 4, he's told to like lay on one side for all these different days and nights, only eat certain things, and he has to cook his bread that he's eating with dung, with dried poop. This is not a compliment. This is, this is offensive to him. It's like, it's like, what do you make? Am I being made unclean? To be what? The son of man? I think that <clears throat> Ezekiel typifies here the loneliness and the substitution that Jesus takes for our sin. Ezekiel 4 gives us more details. I will mention this, though, before we read Ezekiel 4. Ezekiel also spoke in parables. God told him to go speak in riddles to the people, specifically. And so there's another connection there. Um, <clears throat> Ezekiel 4 God tells him in chapter 4, verse 4, Then lie on your left side and place the punishment of the house of Israel upon it. Upon what? Upon his left side. As he's lying down. So he takes this, he takes a piece of clay and he draws a picture of Jerusalem. He sets the clay down and he draws, he makes like a little, a little uh, scale model of the city with like ramparts and, and bombarding coming towards the city. And then he lays down on his left side in front of that. And, he, and, he, and he's the one who's taking the sin upon himself. This doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? Not until you come to Jesus. But let's keep reading. <clears throat> For um, in the number of days that you lie on it, you shall bear their punishment. Remember that phrase, bear their punishment. Verse 5. For I assign to you a number of days, 390 days, equal to the number of years of their punishment. So long shall you bear the punishment of the house of Israel. And when you've completed these, you shall lie down a second time, but on your right side and bear the punishment of the house of Judah. Forty days I assign you a day for each year. So he lays on his left side, lays on his right side. I think that he probably did this during the day when he was trying to do his prophetic ministry. He would lay there and be, either he'd be preaching. Like he did these weird things that would cause people to come and see him um, and get the message across. But I think he probably went, went home at night or whatever. I don't think he was like laying there immovable that whole time. I think that was just his main thing is he'd just be laying there most of the time. But this phrase, bear their punishment, bear their iniquity, this is really interesting because it's rare for God to say that anybody would bear the iniquity of another person. But Ezekiel, this, this, this prophet called the son of man who does these embarrassing things, bringing in a sense like iniquity almost upon him, at least symbolically. The other people who were told that they would bear iniquity are, do you guys know any of their who, who they were? The high priest. The high priest was to bear the iniquity. In, in Leviticus 10, 17, it says that you may bear the iniquity of the congregation to make atonement for them before the Lord. In Numbers 18, 1, it says it again. The high priest bore the iniquity of the people. Another time we get this bear the iniquity is Leviticus 16, 21. We'll talk about this a little bit next time around. But it's the day of atonement where there's this scapegoat and they confess upon this goat the sins of Israel. And it says, um, And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess, it, uh, confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins, and he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. So, this, so the high priest, who represents Jesus, he bears iniquity. The goat, the scapegoat, who represents Jesus, he bears iniquity. Ezekiel, the only prophet called son of man over and over again, 
here bearing the iniquity of the people of Israel, but all in some sort of lesser sense, in some sort of symbolic sense, but Christ in the fullest and truest sense. There's one other time, the only other time in the Bible where this bear the iniquity thing comes up. It's not only is it with the son of man prophet Ezekiel, but it's one other time and it's in Isaiah 53, <clears throat> and I'll read it to you. It occurs three times in the Isaiah 53 passage, verses 5, 6, and 11. So here's Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Now, before someone goes, wait a minute. Ezekiel said bear his punishment. Isaiah says bear iniquity. Leviticus said bear iniquity. But it's the same Hebrew word. The Hebrew word can mean punishment or iniquity. It's the same word in all of these passages. Because... Because I'm like you, and I go, well, wait a minute about that. <laughs> I'll try to poke holes through it. But, but no, it's the exact same word, Hebrew, in all of these passages. Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Same word as for Ezekiel. Isaiah 53, 11. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquity. So I think Ezekiel, he's the only, he's the prophet called the son of man or son of man. And he's the only one who uh, did, did a few of these things that really that Jesus definitely did in a more full sense. Kind of like the high priest, kind of like the scapegoat, kind of like the direct prophecy in Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant. But then it gets better because the best use of the son of man in the Old Testament is in Daniel. In Daniel chapter 7, this, this is what we find. Um, I'll give you a quick summary of Daniel 7. Daniel 7 is like the prophetic visions passage in Daniel. There's a bunch of prophecy happening in Daniel at this point. Um, the visions have different kingdoms coming and they're kingdoms of man. Kingdoms where God is, God is he, yes, he's ultimately sovereign, but he's not the one this kingdom is yielding to deliberately, right? He's working his will, but, but they're not according to their submission. So they're in rebellion to God, these various kingdoms of man that rule. And at the end of all those kingdoms, we get to the final kingdom, which is God setting up his own kingdom. So that's what this part of the vision is about, when God sets up his own kingdom. We would look at this as the second coming of Christ. In Daniel 7, verse 13, it says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. He came to the ancient of days, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Harken back to earlier in Daniel, where Nebuchadnezzar tried to get all peoples and everyone to bow down to his gold image. And then he's like, no, that everyone's going to be bowing down. But it'll be to the son of man character. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. So it's a permanent kingdom. It's the final kingdom, and it's the kingdom that, it, that pleases God. And this person's the son of man. Now, son of man's a lowly title, isn't it? Son of man, it's lowly. Yet it also has this substitutionary aspect to it. Oh, you're going to save Israel. But then it has this highly exalted aspect. In fact, in Daniel, the son of man is presented to the father, the ancient of days, and with the sense of like, Ah, yes, you are worthy. You can, you, can, you can rule the kingdom now. Well, in Revelation, we have this in detail. Worthy are you, O Lord. You know, and then it spe specifically talks about how Christ is worthy to come and take the scroll and basically take over the world. It's an exalted man who's presented, given dominion and a kingdom forever. Um, and that phrase, serve him, in verse 14, is really interesting too. Okay, so Daniel... Here's either, either information you'll love or you're going to be like, TMI, Mike, stop, too much information. But in Daniel, um, the middle of the book of Daniel, from Daniel 2, verse 4, all the way through 728, it's written in a slightly different language than the, than the rest of the book of Daniel. Daniel's written in Hebrew, right? But Daniel 2, 4 through 728 is written in Aramaic. It uses like Hebrew letters, but it's, the language is actually Aramaic. So it's written in Aramaic. So the word serve here... It's a specific word, and it's used nine times in that section of Daniel, in that Aramaic section. So what does it mean by serve? Because some will say, well, serve just means that they're going to do what he says. But in every single other use, all eight other uses of this word in the Aramaic section of Daniel, it's always used to refer to serving and worshiping a deity. Every time. Either some false god that people shouldn't be serving and worshiping, or the true god. 
right? Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we will not bow down and serve your gods. That's the idea. The implication is that this son of man comes and he inherits all things and he is ba- and all peoples bow down and worship and serve him like he's God. Well, that's interesting. So, what did Jesus mean when he said, I'm the son of man? Like, I have lots of different passages here, right? I could say, well, he meant just that he's lowly. Or he meant that he's like Psalm 80, like it's this typological fulfillment. He's going to be taking the place of Israel. Um, Or he meant like this Daniel thing where he is the one coming to establish the kingdom of God and he's to be worshipped. What did Jesus mean? Well, there's a way to determine what Jesus meant. You read what he said, right? And so in Matthew 26, we actually have a conversation where Jesus exposes to us what he meant by the title Son of Man. So what did Jesus think about it? Matthew 26, verse 63 It says, and by the way, this is, this is the trial of Jesus before Caiaphas. So he's, it's, it's the, he had a Jewish trial. He had, um, he had multiple trials, actually, before he was crucified. This is not the Roman trial before Pilate. This is, a, I don't know it's how official it was, but it's a trial before Caiaphas. It's, it's happening in the middle of the night when it probably shouldn't, um, according to Jewish customs, but they were doing it. And they're accusing Jesus of different things, and he just keeps his mouth shut. He remains silent. Verse 63, but Jesus remains silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now notice the question. Are you the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God? The idea here is that they knew that the Messiah and the Son of God were were titles for the same person. Now Messiah is a huge important title. that You're bringing in everything in the Old Testament that it says about the Messiah and saying it's about you. But look at Jesus' answer in verse 64. Jesus said to him, You have said so. This is a way, it's kind of a quirky way in the Greek of him saying, um, that's right, but you don't really fully understand what you're saying. It's it's like affirming what he's saying, but not not the way he's, he's, he's thinking about it. You ever have those discussions like with someone where you're like trying to tell them like, well, yes, that's correct, but but not the way you think. Like, you, <laughs> but you don't know what to do with this information. You haven't got quite it right. Got it quite right. Then he goes on and he says this, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power. Of the power, well, he's talking about God. He's talking about the Father here, and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, this may seem like a riddle. To, to, to a lot of us. But the, Caiaphas, the high priest, knew exactly what Jesus was doing. He's quoting Psalm 110. He's quoting Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14. And he knows exactly what's going on. So what does he do? He responds. The high priest tore his robes, his own robes, right? And he said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witness do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. Because the things he's claiming are things that only really God can claim. Let me explain. In Psalm 110, verse 1, this is the Melchizedek Psalm. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. It's a highly messianic psalm quoted in the New Testament so many times. Um, Jesus used it to pose a riddle to the, to the, to the, was it the scribes or the Pharisees or Sadducees? I forget which one it was he riddled them with. But he says, riddle me this, Batman, he says to them. (laughs) That's 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 not, that was the uh, Passion Translation version. Um, He (laughs) said, And Jesus said, riddle me this, Batman, if, uh, if, if the Messiah, right, is David's Lord, well, then who is the Messiah? That's kind of what he comes out with, Psalm 110. And it says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And so it's like, well, who's David's Lord? He's the king of Israel. Who is his Lord? The Lord Jehovah, Yahweh, right? He says to David's Lord, well, who's that? So he's trying to say he's greater than David. As Jesus said, greater than David, greater than Abraham, greater than the tabernacle. He was trying to show who he was. But to sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool, I think that Caiaphas understood this is what Jesus was saying when he says, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. And then when he comes on high, it's to take that kingdom. That's the reference to Daniel. In fact, that phrase rides on the clouds. Everybody knew, every good Jewish person knew, Yahweh rides on the clouds. It's Yahweh who rides on the clouds. It's not you. It's not your grandma. It's not your favorite football player, right? Like this is, this is Yahweh. In fact, it was a title used of Baal from back in the day 
they would say Baal was the cloud rider, the one who, who rides on the clouds. So when the scriptures use the term that Yahweh rides on the clouds, it's like a slap in the face to those who believe in Baal. I mean, you know what the scripture says about Baal. It's like the, these things, they're false images, false gods. It's all fake. And basically they're trying to rob from God things. So, so that was kind of like a big slap in the face. Like God has this, has this title. He is this, he is the one who has all the authority of heaven is the idea. Well, the son of man is going to come with the clouds coming on the clouds of heaven. And the high priest of course responds. So Jesus is affirming that as son of man, he's more than just a man. He has all of these aspects of these Old Testament statements. He's this lowly servant. He's just a human destined to die. Yet he has this sort of glorious future where he comes to reign and set up God's kingdom. Yet, yet this Psalm 80, he has this sort of substitutionary thing where he's going to save Israel. He'll be the one who comes and delivers them from the judgment of their sins. But Jesus, he knew that was more than just a lowly thing. Listen to other things Jesus said. He says in Matthew 9, 6, the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. In, Ma in Matthew 12, 8, he said the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. He claimed to be the boss of the Sabbath. In Mark 10, 45, he says, even as the son of man came not to serve, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Of course, he knew he was here to substitute for you, be that substitution. Um, so there's both sides. It's the glory and the gory the glory of his second coming and the goriness of the first of the suffering of the cross. John 5, 27, it says, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Speaking of the father, the father has given him authority to execute judgment because he's the son of man. According to Matthew 13, 41, the son of man has his own angels. He's going to come with his angels. They belong to him. And in Matthew 25, 31, he's going to sit on the throne of his own glory. And there's something else that's interesting. Jesus refers to himself as the son of man over and over again. He never calls himself a son of man. The term is used in general of sons of men. They're just these sort of, we all, we all share in this sort of weakness and frailty. We're sons of men. Even you girls are sons of men in that category, right? But the son of man refers to him as being the ultimate one, the ultimate human. The fulfillment of all of these things. And so if there is to be one special son of man in the Old Testament, it's fulfilled in Christ. So we look at sons of men as a general frailty of humanity, but the son of man as the one who will come and fulfill all the foreshadowings that we've seen before. Jesus never refers to himself as a son of man, always the son of man. Just like he refers to himself as the vine. We know that Israel's is called of the vine or a vine. He planted a choice vine. They're like a vine, but Jesus says, I'm the vine. Israel's talked about as being a branch. Jesus, he's the branch. Scripture talks about manna from heaven. Jesus is the manna from heaven, the bread from heaven. Scripture talks about shepherds, how the, the leaders of Israel were shepherds. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the door. I'm the way. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of these ideas. That's the idea. So when you see themes in the Old Testament, like son of man or vine or branch or the, the general ideas of prophets, he's not just called a prophet, he's called the prophet, right? He's, he is the, ultimately, he's the one of all those things. I think that it refers to, uh, to Christ in his not only direct prophetic fulfillment, but in the typological foreshadowing fulfillment, how Jesus comes and he accomplishes everything that we fail, he does so he's the son of man. This refers to his deity and his humanity. It's a huge title. The full scope of all that it means in the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ. So who did Jesus think he was? Well, I think he thought more of himself than most people today think of him. I really do. He thought he was the son of man, a lowly human who had nowhere to lay his head. He thought he was God's agent for saving man by suffering in man's place. That we would, he would die for our sins to, to pay the ransom for us. He thought he was the future coming permanent ruler of all who rides the clouds. That's all in the phrase son of man. I, and I wonder why it was his favorite title for himself. Now, if you start with the New Testament and you don't know the Old Testament very well, you just think son of man. Why did he say that all the time? Why is he talking himself down? 
You know, Jesus, you're so much more than that. In fact, even later authors in the New Testament didn't refer to him as son of man. They generally referred to him as son of God, Christ, you know, Lord. They would just call him those types of things. Jesus refers to himself as the son of man because he, I think he knows the plan that he's made and the fulfillment of all of it that is it throughout all of the scriptures uh, because Jesus is throughout the Old Testament. So this was, this is actually a study I share with you guys because I didn't have time to prepare the other study I wanted to share with you guys, but I thought it was something really neat to do. And um, uh, uh, one day I'll do a, a full-on teaching on Jesus' self-identity. We'll just look at all the passages where he talks about who he is. But this is just to get you to appreciate Ezekiel, Psalms, um, Daniel, and then to realize that even when, he, when they're hearing him teach these things, the high priest recognizes what Jesus is claiming of himself. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Son of Man and for the fulfillment of all of your promises and for all of the foreshadowings of the Old Testament that we see fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus' self-identity. We just want to see who he is the way he said it, the way he saw it. And we pray, Lord, that we would uh, we'd be armed against uh, skeptics who, maybe not even because they're trying to be deceitful, they just don't know but that we, with a full knowledge of the scriptures, will be able to teach others who Christ is and who Jesus was saying he was and the fullness of him coming lowly like a worm that he might come again being the son of man who rides on the clouds, who is, is taken over all things. Lord, we, we bow now, we submit now, we yield now, we serve and worship you now, Jesus. And we pray for your glory in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.